Right then, it's four o'clock, shall we kick off? Okay. So, uh, thanks for joining everyone who's made it. Um, we are um, going to do a quick, a very quick webinar. We won't take up too much of your time on a sunny Friday afternoon, but uh, hopefully it'll be useful and worth um, the few minutes. We're going to sort of whiz through and then have a QA and a at the end. So, I suppose let's move on to sort of um, explain a little bit about who we are. Let me move a slide on. Uh, so, yes, a bit about us. Um, so I'm going to introduce Rob. Rob is a, uh, a former uh, communications director of um, two of the major water companies, Seven Trent and Yorkshire Water, um, has a wealth of experience in his sector in communications and has since gone on to uh, and still is managing global brand communications for uh, several large corporations, particularly MasterCard, uh, where he's pretty integral in uh, making sure that all teams are kind of uh, happy and well connected. Okay, um, hi there everyone. I'll introduce Tom. So Tom's one of the most creative people I've ever met. I've had the privilege to work right. with Tom for the last two to three years. Um, obviously his record and his, uh, his background speaks for itself. He's worked for brands like Unilever, Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola, and he's been working with me on MasterCard for two to three years, providing you know, really fantastic uh, creative insights and input. Uh, and so thanks Robin. So also we uh, we have a panel um, sort of fielding any questions in the background. Um, we've got uh, Neil and Richard who author, also bring a wealth of experience um, from a number of sectors. Uh, so they'll be able to uh, take any questions during and, uh, and then obviously add at the end as well. We have a bit of a QA. and a So that's us. Um, we've decided um, collectively um, to join our sort of uh, forces. We work together a lot anyway, so we thought, well, actually, it would be quite useful if we kind of came together and uh, passed on some information and insights to um, to others. So we so we decided to form the assembly. A um, it's a mixture of comms, creative, and business, and we're starting off with this comms series where we'll just do a series of short webinars, all sort of comms tips. Um, the first one uh, we're starting with is uh, how to build trust in a virtual team. So. Moving on to Rob. Okay, so um, we all know that teams don't work very well when teams don't trust each other. So we've been working with a number of big organisations, as we've mentioned over recent years, and they've been able to instill a very high level of trust in their own teams. And what we discovered is that they all do similar things. So this is what this webinar is all about. We'd like to share what we've learned today from working with those sorts of organisations. So I think there's, a, there's plenty of research to sort of show that trust has a real impact on uh, on, on team performance. Um, and uh, so we we kind of sort of want to highlight some of those points along the way. Um, so your yeah, virtual good. team, that's the main thing, isn't it? Yeah, so as Tom said, research tells us that high-performing teams do have a high level of trust with each other and their leader. But as we know, trust is actually a lot harder to establish when you're not working face to face every day with colleagues. So particularly in, in virtual teams, you have to work a lot harder to actually build and establish the trust that you might take for granted when you work very closely with colleagues. I think the other thing as well is that uh, the relationship between trust and team performance, uh, I think, is more and more important when there's a, diff a, a, a larger sort of uh, distance between um, the authority of one team member and another so um, that you know that can really affect um, uh, the performance if there's uh, you know a, a larger gap between you know the seniority of the team members I suppose. Yeah, actually, I was actually doing a bit of online research for this uh, presentation Tom and it says that actually only half of us trust colleagues are working productively when we're away from the office not many, is it? <laughs> no, it isn't, is it? I 100% trust all of our teams, so, uh, <laughs> but um, I, I'm sure it's not, yeah, not the case with many companies. Um, I expect there's a lot of people thinking that people are sat not doing a lot. And it goes both ways as well, I, I suspect. Uh, sort of people thinking their team uh, aren't working so hard and that people thinking their bosses aren't working so hard. Perhaps I, th I, think, I think everyone feels they need to post baby pictures and post picture them, them doing the gardening and doing the cooking and all of that sort of stuff so obviously people are doing a lot but you know are they do we trust they're actually getting on with the job <laughs> um so how do we build trust 
how to build trust. That's kind of uh, what, what we're trying to sort of lay out here. We've put, we've put it into four sort of uh, clear points, um, which we're going to sort of run through and sort of we've got some tips within those sort of four points. So the four main points are set a clear vision, values and priorities, clarify roles and responsibilities, communicate often and predictably, um, and empower your people. So we're going to start with setting a clear vision, vision values and priorities. Um, and the first one we think is really important is set a future vision. Okay, so I'll, I'll pick up on that. So what we've discovered is that um, virtual teams often lack a very clear vision. And that makes it really difficult to align the team behind a common goal and a direction. The best teams I've worked with all have a very clear and visible North Star to guide them and to chart their progress against. So having a North Star keeps people focused, keeps people aligned to a common purpose, and mo most importantly, it keeps people free of any kind of distraction from their core, core purpose and core, core role. So focused teams obviously produce a lot better results than unfocused teams and actually can be trusted to deliver the plan. Yeah, and so building trust in this area is likely to help keep team members uh, focus on their collective goal as well, um, rather than sort of um, just looking after their personal interests. So having a, having a really clear North Star or, or kind of big goal is, uh, you know, uh, and having trust to back that up um, equals, uh, you know, higher performance. So the second point is uh, values, really. Um, so as Rob would say, time to walk the talk. Yeah, but you've stole my best line now, Tom. Uh, no, sorry, you can say it again. <laughs> so, uh, so, okay, so you spent a lot of time, every team spends time defining their values. They've got a PowerPoint presentation somewhere. Maybe you've got it on a wall around the office. But now is the actual ultimate time when values are, are put to the test. And as Tom said, an opportunity for you to walk the walk. So that proposition, the promises you made to your people when they joined, uh, the objectives that you measure in their annual review. Now, this is the time to show as a leader that you actually mean it. So if, if as part of your values, you always are punctual and stick to time, you need to make sure that your virtual meetings finish on time. Now, it's, it's actually living those values now that, that build trust in the team and you know, back up, back up your, your words with actions. And if you have an internal space or don't have one, create one. Um, to have uh, values you know clear for everyone to see just as a reminder you know some companies we work with have, have them on their mugs you know uh, but obviously they're not in the office at the moment so you've got to have some other way of just having those values around about the place uh, virtually uh, to make sure people just you know just remember it's always a nice reminder um, to keep people on track well, maybe we should send every, everyone a mug with their values on them, Tom. Or a, or a mouse mat. Yeah, one of the... <laughs> okay, merchandise opportunity. Someone take notes on the panel. Um, so uh, moving to the second point, um, to clarify roles, roles, tasks and responsibilities. That's actually quite difficult to say. Um, and uh, the, the first point uh, is being clear about these. Yes, that's a really, that's a really important one. So um, in my experience, most of the conflict in virtual teams tends to occur when there's a lack of clarity around roles and responsibilities. So you're on a conference call, you hear about a project from a colleague that maybe you should be involved in or that overlaps with the work that you're doing. And you wonder, you know, why, why aren't I involved in that? I thought I was leading that project and now I'm hearing that somebody else is doing it. Um, so in, when you're working together in a normal office environment, you, you understand the gaps and the overlaps between your projects and your roles and responsibilities with others. And that's a lot harder to do in a virtual world. So critically important that at the beginning of working together as a team, you establish these deliverables and, and clear roles and responsibilities and actually assign specific initiatives to people so that everyone knows who's leading what and what the key projects are. Yeah, it's also a really good opportunity to, to develop um, some leadership responsibility within the uh, team and uh, allow people just that, you know, give a bit of rope, let a bit of rope loose and let people um, uh, have a chance to lead on specific projects and initiatives, even if it's sort of um, smaller things. Um, I think it's a good opportunity to test people because it's very hard to micromanage um, uh, everybody all at once. So, um, you know, let people shine, I think is, is a really key thing we can kind of 
take as a positive from the current situation. So next point is defining deliverables and tracking your commitments. Yeah, so um, it's even more important, obviously, when you're not working day to day with people to track your, your projects a lot more closely and to have that very visible for people. So there are a lot of very great, um, good, empowering apps out there for remote teams to use and track work. Uh, you're probably familiar with Miro or, or Trello. And they, they are an opportunity to professionalise what you do and also an opportunity for you to sit down with your team virtually once a week and go through all of those, those deliverables and commitments and red flag them or green flag them and you know, understand where you are in terms of heading towards that, that North Star. So it's really useful for a lot of the teams we work with to create a, a deliverables dashboard online so that it's very visible to the team that people can input and you know, use it as part of their meetings and their collaboration hubs. Yeah, and this can be done um, uh, in Microsoft Teams or if you're really serious about it, you can go and get some software uh, such as Streamtime or, you know, um, but these things do pay for themselves in spades in terms of time management, people management, keeping your team up to date on everything. Um, and we're going to try and do a, um, one of our webinars. We'll kind of go into that in a bit more detail, talk about the sort of the good free stuff and the, and the good um, more expensive stuff um, and uh, you know, cover that off in a little bit more detail a little further down the track. Um, so we'll move on to the next thing now. Uh, so uh, this is another big one. Uh, communicate often and predictably. Um, so the first kind of uh, idea within this is keeping to a comms pattern. Yeah, so um, I mean, particularly in the current situation, everyone feels like they ought to be communicating a lot with each other. So we see lots of good intention messages, lots of emails, lots of videos, lots of ad hoc meetings. But, you know, the best communication is communication that sticks to a regular comms pattern that's predictable. Um, and the worst performing teams are typically characterised by those that have a kind of a chaotic or unorganised um, communications pattern and very poor meeting discipline as well. So, you know, have, have that regular cadence, have regular meetings the same day each week or month, have an agenda, uh, start and finish on time, follow up actions. You know, just because the meeting's online, it doesn't mean that it has to lose all of that usual meeting discipline and rigour that you may have in the normal office environment. So keeping a regular comms pattern is a, is a, a real important factor to building trust in a team. We're kind of currently doing about uh, two a week on a regular uh, time frame. Everyone's expecting it. Um, it. It works really well and it just helps keep everybody sort of feeling like they know what's going on and, and feeling part of it. So, yeah, it's very important. Uh, so moving on to the next one. Uh, next point is uh, be human. I think that's a really, really key factor and, uh, and give regular personal stories. Uh, so it's one of Rob's favourites, this one. <laughs> yeah, I like, I like telling uh, stories, but I'm, I, I always find it really difficult to be human on, on Skype calls or even webinars for that matter, because it always feels a bit kind of artificial. But um, I'm trying to teach myself to do things like, you know, turn off, off the mute. Uh, don't worry when the kids run behind the chair when you're halfway through a Skype call. Um, you know, it's, we're not working in office, we're working from home. So it's important that people actually get a sense of your human side and your, per, your personal life, because from that, you know, that's how people build relationships. They, they can, it sparks conversations. Um, you, can, you have something in common. You know, I don't know how many conversations I've heard over the last month of people talking about their pets or their dogs. So, you know, we trust people that are similar to us. We trust people that have something in common with us. So let's, um, you know, let's like hair down and share those personal stories. Yeah, so for right now, this moment in time, I've got um, a baby having its nappy changed right above this room. So you can probably hear in the background some screaming. <laughs> it's not very happy about it. But that's, you know, it's exactly the sort of thing that happens, uh, you know, whilst you're online at home. It's not a problem. Everyone has babies. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's important to, to share that common ground with people. Um, so uh, being open, transparent and honest. Uh, important as well uh, with your team particularly um, and also with your clients and customers as well I think. Yeah I mean the, the best um, the best leaders as we all know are those that are open 
transparent and honest. And I've seen some fantastic examples of very senior leadership in some of the big organisations we work with, talking directly and honestly to their people with a high level of personal courage. You know, particularly in this current situation, it's a case of um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, people want to know, how, how am I, do I have a job? Um, you know, when, when is this situation going to end? Will this affect my pay and rewards? So it's really important that leaders, you know, address those pretty fundamental things up, up front and they establish a, a huge amount of trust in the team, which then, of course, people are then more receptive to listen to the other messages and, and uh, about more work-related matters. Um, I think it's also important that managers and leaders don't shy away from tackling conflict in a team. Um, bad bad behaviour, conflicts, arguments among team members are more often likely to be ignored in a virtual environment because people can hide away behind their computer screens. And you know, if you allow that to happen and you don't address it, then that situation can quickly become quite quite toxic in a virtual team. So transparency, honesty, personal leadership and courage are are very effective ways of building trust in your your remote workers and your 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 virtual team. I can't add a lot to that other than having you know try to keep as transparent and honest as we can with our team. Uh, that there's relief and uh, gratitude I think that comes from letting them know where where we stand as a business, what's going on, you know, uh, as often as possible, um, and you know, trusting them with the with the right information is important. So. Um, the final big point is uh, empower your people uh, and the first um, tip here really is uh, leaders become monitor and mentor yeah so the point here is that you know we're not in a big corporate head office now so that kind of traditional command and control structure doesn't really have a place a virtual team is by its very nature, nature decentralized so it works in a, a very different way a sort of matrix way so the leader needs to change the way that he or she leads in that environment more of a, a mentor uh, listening understanding trying to support colleagues rather than micromanaging them so it's more of the role of the monitor and the mentor and also in high trust teams um, you, you often find that the leader will allow others to lead in different at different times or to take on key projects rather than trying to control everything so with effective communication obviously that creates a more agile team decisions can be made quicker and progress can be made a lot faster if um, a leader encourages other team members to actually take the lead and um, and change the way they, they, they lead as a, as a leader. And I think it's kind of going back to one of our other points earlier really is that um, you, if you, if you allow some of your team members to take more responsibility or to lead on certain projects, they will grow faster, they'll grow stronger um, and you become the monitor and mentor to that. So as long as you're keeping an eye on what they're doing, you will find that your team will flourish hopefully. So um, moving on to the next point. Um, so this is, this is about encouraging team members to share best practice and leadership. So sharing their skills, their, their tips and their understanding with other team members. Yeah, so the, the way you build trust with, with colleagues, is, as we all know, is actually by doing something together. It's actually by working together. So, you know, talk comes cheap. Um, you can you, you hear some leaders saying a lot of stuff, but not doing a lot of stuff. So this, this is an opportunity to actually get colleagues to work together, to, to collaborate and co-create things virtually, or even to set up a group to share their best practice, like a, a kind of guild across across the team where they can share their specific skills on one area or another through webinars or online uh, forums and communications a bit like this so working remotely actually creates an opportunity for people to get together in lots of different ways and to share their best practice and experience and now that should be encouraged to empower your teams to to actually take the lead and also to share best practice i think when people trust each other they're more likely to share um, and work through problems, raising your output quality. Um, and I think uh, there is research to show uh, lack of trust in the team uh, 
you know, leads to people tending to focus their effort and energy on defending their personal interests, I've seen stated. So, which kind of is common sense, really, uh, and, you know, with a lack of trust resulting in people in the team being reluctant to share their expertise, hoping to avoid criticism, that kind of thing. So it's, yeah, it, building that kind of trust and encouraging this um, it is definitely the way forward. It will really help kind of build strength and, and good team bonds. So uh, we're going to have a little summary now, and then uh, we're going to just open it up to Q&A, um, put the videos on and things if people are interested to hang around for a few more minutes um, and then we'll answer any questions or we'll try to <laughs> so yeah so to summarize uh, these are our points and um, we're going to also we're uh, recording so we'll have this up online if you want to um, uh, you know refer back to this at any point if you find it interesting or useful um, so um, I'm just going to now add some of our panelists back in um, I'm going to add Neil back in um, and unmute him. Um, and um, Neil, are you, are you there now? I'm here. There we go. Um, so, um, what's the best way to uh, field a Q and A? Then, should we should we allow all attendees to talk? Is that the best way of doing it? Yeah, or they can put the questions into the Q and A box if they prefer. But either way, it's fine. Cool. Okay, I will. Um, I'll do both then. So if anyone's interested in asking a question, I'm just allowing everyone the talk option. I mean, if we've done really well, there might not be any questions at all. <laughs> so yeah, does anyone, does anyone have a question they want to ask us? I know we've just yeah. rattled through. Hello, can you hear me? This is Anna here. Hi there. Hi, yeah. Yeah, I did have one. Um, because we, we've obviously been having a lot of virtual meetings recently. And one of them was some advice specifically about how you chair meetings to make sure everybody gets a chance to be involved. Um, so I think you've, you've touched on some of those points, but any more specific advice on making sure, especially when you've got quite a few people in the room, that they get a chance to all talk? I think this is probably one for Rob, because I'm not very good at chairing meetings. I talk way too much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the only thing I would say, depending on the number of people, it's obviously better to to take questions at the end of the meeting, you know, rather than rather than at the beginning. So, particularly when you've got a large audience, it can actually, you know, take take the message or take the the presentation off in a completely different direction. Particularly if one of those questions is quite tricky. So, you know, I've seen some very big um, meetings, some very big conference calls recently in the current situation, uh, with companies like, you know, global calls from, from MasterCard for the chief exec, and um, they will get through their content and then they'll probably leave about half the present presentation time actually for, for questions and they'll take them one at a time. Um, so, you know, that, that, I'm, I hope that answers the question. All I would say is, you know, get through your content first. Don't um, shotgun your presentation with lots of questions from different people and then and then pick up the questions at the end. Or alternatively, another way of approaching it I've seen work very well is actually get people to submit their questions in advance of the meeting um, so that you can pick out key themes that are emerging and then you're answering a whole groups of questions in, in one go. Um, so, you know, that can be a very effective way of, of covering off a lot of topics without, you know, an endless um, stream of questions or, or, or putting too much pressure on you as a, a chairman to actually handle them all or to address them all. Does that help, Anna? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Is, is there any more questions? I'm going to just um, stop the screen share now. So we're on. Or, 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 or any suggestions, actually. I mean, we, we, you know, we've picked out four key themes in our presentation, which may seem quite obvious, I guess. Um, but it's amazing how many people kind of feel like they need to muddle through at the moment rather than being proactive. So um, we'd, we'd welcome any, any ideas or suggestions or thoughts that have been provoked by the presentation as well, I guess. So it's kind of open forum. Anyone feeling brave? <laughs> <laughs> we're kind of new to webinars really, aren't we, Tom? Yeah, well, exactly. I think we're, uh, you know, we're, we're doing the same sort of thing, really. We're trying um, to make sure that we, we do a lot of this sort of stuff for other people. We enable other people to do it, but 
having to do it ourselves is, is a new thing, I suppose. Um, so we sort of thought, well, you know, it, it's worth embracing this. Um, so we've got years of experience in, in working virtually. We, we do it within our own team. We have an office and we have virtual team members. We've been doing this for a very long time. Um, it's not like, oh, we suddenly started doing it because of the, uh, you know, because of the coronavirus situation or, and, and we're very firm believers that it will just become now the norm. So it's, um, well, we've been, you know, one of our values is, I talked about values is walk, walk the talk. As you might expect, that is a value of ours. So we, we're advising clients, we're helping them work with webinars and conference calls and internal engagement. So we thought we better, um, we better actually do it ourselves and have a go. That's what we're doing. We've got um, uh, a question on the open forum uh, uh, for probably for you, Rob, as well. Um, someone's asking, it's from Anonymous, so um, I can't name and shame anyone for this one, but it's saying, can you explain who is a North Star? Is it a leader or is it a goal? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, it's a goal, actually. So it's what, probably one of those um, fancy business buzzwords that, that that's going doing the rounds at the it's, moment. It's but like the old um, big hairy audacious goal as well as another. It <laughs> is, yeah. I mean, the, the, thing that, the thing about a North Star is that it always stays in one place you know it's fixed in the sky so when the ancient mariners used to travel across the seas they would navigate their ships using the north star and it would never change it was un unwavering so the idea is that you have a goal that is always fixed and always constant and you're always gravitating towards so it's not it's not a, a vaunting thing like a vision that you never quite reach it it is it is something that's achievable it's quantifiable it's um, you know going to achieve X or Y percent or 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 a fixed number, um, so but it's something that you always always monitor as a team uh, every week or every month or whatever the appropriate timescale is. How close are we getting to that goal? And everything sort of spans off that. It's the, the star at the top of the pyramid, if you like, um, and. You know, it's a pretty. Yeah, I think it's a pretty effective way of focusing a team on, you know, what 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 your purpose is ultimately and what's important to you. And I've seen it work very well. You can have a number of north stars actually. It might might sound a bit kind of contradictory, but <laughs> I've seen a number of teams with a couple of north stars um, that guide guide the team's um, decision making. So we've got another another question in. Um, the question is, would you suggest lots of small informal meetings during the day or set times? Um, I'll try and take this one on. Um, I would suggest that uh, you have a set time meeting for your grander team meetings um, and make sure that's a regular thing. And it's at the same time each week, if, if at all possible, it, it should be moved and deliberately for something that's absolutely unavoidable, but otherwise it's always there. Um, if you're going to have meetings during the day, um, small and formal conversations are fine, um, but you will obviously need to be able to get some work done. So what I would suggest is just sort of allocating a, a period of the day when you're available for small um, meetings. Um, I think uh, that's the best way to do it. So your team knows you're available at 9.30 to 10, and it's given you some time to do your emails, and you're available again for half an hour before lunch, and then et cetera, et cetera. Otherwise, you'll never get those blocks of, you know, an hour or so where you can actually get something done. You'll, as I found a few times recently, on the phone or on Teams or on Zoom or whatever, all day, team members, clients, everyone asking you questions, and then you you really think, right, now, six o'clock, I better start doing some work. Um, so, yeah, I would say um, a bit of both, but make sure you're, um, you're kind of, you're time slotting your, uh, your informal meets, if you can at all. So hopefully that helps. Uh, here's, I think with, with the, here's just building on that, Tom, with the with the formal meetings, it's really important to to show up. You know that 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 people take them seriously. That I mentioned in the talk. You know, you have an agenda, you have uh, time limits, you have follow on actions, you document them, so that you keep everyone in the loop, really, and everyone everyone is confident that they're getting the information that they need. I, I, it's really strange that I've seen. And I won't name names, but some some companies that I've worked with um, feel that just because you're on Skype and you're at home uh, or on Teams or whatever, you can you can all that kind of meeting discipline seems to go out the window, and they just turn into kind of random chats 
rather than proper meetings. So if you're having those formal set piece meetings, you know, treat them, yeah. treat them like proper, proper meetings and that build trust. Yeah, an agenda type thing. Uh, there's another another couple of questions to start here. Um, this is this is a good one actually. Uh, how would you ensure your team feel valued when clients expect work to be completed within the usual turnaround time, even though your internal team may, may be smaller than normal at the current time? Um, so well, uh, we've we've had a lot of this um, recently. Um, we. I suppose are uh, just making sure we're absolutely every time we have a communication thanking the team for working so hard and actually clients that as long as they're aware that you're you're doing this clients will will thank the team member as well so making sure that if you send something out that the team member sees the communication if the client comes back with some positive feedback that kind of thing um <coughs> you know a, a lot of people do respect the fact that you know that <clears throat> urgent comms at the moment and smaller teams is uh, is a struggle uh, they'll often be thinking about their problems and not yours um, and just expecting you know deliverables but when you remind them uh, that, you know you know thanks for this work appreciate it uh, we are a small team so please bear with us um, then you know they, it will sort of I think remind people on the whole um, but yeah it's I think just keep keep thanking team team members in front of other team members this is why it's really good to have that weekly team meeting so you can call out some key stuff that people have done in the week that's good um, uh, another question is do you suggest social zoom meets and events uh, yes absolutely um, we have a don't we Neil we have a, um, a Friday uh, a Friday beer uh, which we probably need to do more of and we might do one after this as well uh, where we have a yeah a virtual what did you call it before i think it was just virtual pub wasn't it virtual pub that was it yeah um so i think they'd even managed to get the pub in the background on um on the thing so and a few of us were sat in the garden so it was like you know uh, but yeah it's it's i think that's good as well just to again break break off the week um hopefully it'll, the conversation will turn from work into sort of what you've been up to and what you're hoping to do at the weekend rather than you know to kind of uh, but yeah that's important as well i would say so, yeah, I think you can actually be quite creative around that. We were um, virtual virtual events. I think is a massive opportunity in future because uh, we've just done one of those um, uh, kind of cocktail nights, and we sort of tried to blend the virtual world with the physical world at the same time. So we sent everyone a pack, and in the pack it had you know, cocktail umbrellas, and it had had uh, cherries and things like that. Um, and they, they were sent to their home addresses and then we had a time for the cocktail evening. So they actually had something that they could um, unpack, like a little kit to make up the cocktail and everyone could show their cocktails off. So you can have a lot of fun with this and you can actually blend, you can make the virtual world to be kind of blur with the, the physical world in a way if, if you're creative around it and it can be quite fun. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a good point uh, as well as I think we could probably even do uh, one of our creative uh, webinars we could probably come armed with a few ideas for these sorts of things um, if that's of interest to anyone uh, we could probably uh, uh, do, a, do a, a short one on that as well it'd be quite fun uh, so are there any any other questions uh, from anyone um, I think that's probably it then unless anyone's got any any more I mean you're all able to talk if you want to um, but otherwise we shall um, probably wrap up there and say um, our next uh, short webinar will be in hopefully two weeks time all being well um, it'll be the next in the series of our kind of comms uh, um, sort of set of, of short webinars and we'll um, we'll be picking up in a, in a similar vein hopefully so yeah sort of hopefully some key tips and, um, and the Q&A at the end uh, so uh, thanks everyone for attending Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye.